going to a city where the streets of gold all lay, where the tree of life is blooming, and the woes is never fade. Here they bloom, but for a season, soon their beauty is decayed. I am going to a city where the woes is never fade. In this world we have our troubles. Satan snails we must obey We'll be free from all temptations Well, the woes is never fair Here they bloom but for a season Soon their beauty is decayed I am going to a city where the woes is never fade. Loved ones gone to be with Jesus in their robes of white await. Now all waiting for my coming. Well, the woes is never fair. Here they bloom, but for a season. Soon their beauty is decayed. I am going to a city where the woes is never fair. Thank you. I've been wanting to do it. That's my grandma's favorite song. Amen. If you don't think that's difficult, we'll have you sing the next one. Amen. Thank you, Sister Carla. Amen. First Chronicles chapter 22 this evening. First Chronicles chapter number 22. I'll continue our message from this morning. Amen. Amen. Be much in prayer for our young people this week as they go. Listen, I have no doubt that they'll have fun. But it'd be a shame for them to go and not get something spiritual. Amen. Amen. Um, there's no doubt at that place that there will be fun had by all. But uh, what we're sending you for is to get something from the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I'd like to see i like to see them come back different than how they went, amen, amen. Uh, closer to God, amen. If we send any that are not saved, that they'd come back uh, with an eternal change made in their lives, amen. I don't know if we have any going that's lost, but I promise you they do, and the Lord knows, and he, can, he is well able to make them aware of their spiritual state with Him, amen. First Chronicles chapter 22. We'll start reading in, uh, let's start in verse number 6. We did verses 2 through 5 this morning. We'll start in verse number 6, read the rest of the chapter, and uh, I'll see what the Lord wants to do. Verse 6, he said this, Then he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, 
and he shall be my son and I will be his father and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now my son, the Lord be with thee and prosper thou and build the house of the Lord thy God as he hath said of thee. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. Then shalt thou prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Dread not, nor be dismayed. Now behold, in my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord an hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand thousand talents of silver and of brass and iron without weight, for it is in abundance. Timber also and stone have I prepared... And and thou mayest add thereto. Moreover, there are workmen with thee in abundance, hewers and workers of stone and timber and all manner of cunning men for every manner of work of the gold, the silver, and the brass, and the iron. There is no number. Arise therefore and be doing, and the Lord be with thee. David also commanded all the princes of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you? And hath he not given you rest on every side? For he hath given the inhabitants of the land into mine hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise therefore and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. That will be the conclusion of the reading. This morning we dealt with those uh, verses 2 through verse number 5 and we talked about the house that David desired to build for God and how that uh, he had spent a great deal of time preparing the materials that were needed uh, in order for Solomon to build uh, to build the house of God. We also talked about uh, the materials that were to be used and the, uh, the need for those materials. And we would end in verse number 5 talking about uh, the need for this, uh, this house of God to be exceeding magnificent and how that there was a necessity that this house uh, be different than all the other facilities that would be around that place. And if I were to, uh, to reiterate a point of this morning's message, I would say this, uh, that there is a great need for our houses of God, the church house, uh, to be much different than the things of the world and the places of the world. It is supposed to be a place uh, of repri a reprieve and a, a place that is set apart uh, as to the worship and the, uh, the praise of God himself. And it is a place uh, that ought to be distinguishable from the places of this world. And we talked about how that uh, how that the children of God are supposed to be the same in their lives, how that uh, your life is supposed to be uh, lived in a manner that is distinguishable from, uh, from the world. Uh, there is an eternal difference made in your life and that ought to reflect in your life uh, that you are not just like everybody else uh, that's out in this world, but there, there is a change uh, that has been wrought in your life. And so we saw... Uh, there, point number one, uh, David's preparation in verses 2 through 5. Let's look at David's pupil in verses 6 through 13. And we'll move quickly, uh, try to bring it home and uh, do a little preaching to our young people here in a few moments. David's pupil in verse number 6, let's look at David's charge. Uh, then he called for Solomon there in verse 6, uh, his son, and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. Uh, now the king's command was to his son Solomon. And something you'll notice from the text is this, uh, that Solomon was a, a young man, that he was a... a, a what I would call as a youthful man uh, when he begins to make these uh, these uh determinations, requirements uh, of Solomon. Uh, when you look at the life of Solomon, understand this uh, that Solomon comes from uh, what we would say is somewhat of a checkered past. Uh, now we first learn of David and uh, Solomon's mother Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter number 11. And to be honest with you, it's one of the darkest days uh, of David's life as he is walking that housetop and he commits that uh, adulterous sin with another man's wife Uriah, the Hittite's wife uh, Bathsheba and then he 
he would go on uh, to add to his sin murder. And may I say this, uh, this just in passing, uh, you, what you'll find with sin is that sin often adds and it adds and it adds uh, because sin is never satisfied. And what you'll see is this, uh, that what he would do is he would attempt uh, to add sin to sin uh, to cover up the initial sin uh, that he had committed. And what you'll see is this, uh, that not only did it cost Uriah his life, uh, but David would make a, pro a proclamation concerning uh, four lambs in the next chapter uh, given for uh, one lamb and how that David would watch four of his own children uh, die because of his sin. What a troublesome a troublesome history. Now Solomon is the son of Bathsheba because eventually what you'll find is that David would take Bathsheba unto him uh, to wife. And so you, what you would see is this, uh, that Solomon, uh, let's say he just doesn't have exactly the most uh, the most pleasant past uh, concerning his parents. There's no doubt uh, that everybody knew what his, his father and his mother had done. You say, how do they know? Because the prophet proclaimed it. Yes. Amen. You know what it turns out? It turns out you can't hide your sin. Amen. Because there's somebody in heaven that sees it all. Amen. And is able to reveal those things and bring that which is done in darkness to light. But as we see this, you'll notice that this is uh, Solomon's history. But what you see is this, that this, this call, this charge is given to Solomon by uh, King David, his father. And what you are seeing is this, that it was David's desire uh, to build this house of God. And yet uh, what we would go on to see uh, in verses 7 and 8 as we look at David's craving, what you'll see is this, uh, that God was not going to allow David uh, to build this house. And uh, verse 7 and 8, he said this, and David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build in house unto the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to, to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly, and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build in house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. And so it is an intriguing aspect around King David's life. Uh, that King David was a man of war. Uh, that in his, uh, in his life, in his kingship, a uh, much of his life uh, was spent in uh, going around and reclaiming all the land that King Saul had lost uh, in his uh, de in King Saul's determination uh, to track down David and to destroy uh, the one that he thought was his adversary. And we understand this, that David was never Saul's adversary, was he? No. Isn't it amazing what sin will do in your life, though? It'll make you see those ones that are there to help as adversaries. Listen to me, young people. It's time and time and time again I've seen young people get out of church and they look to the ones that were there to help them and they treated them like they were their adversaries, like they were against them. Can I tell you, none of your youth leaders are against you. Amen. None of your youth leaders are against you. And if I could take it a step further, understand this, and this will be a phrase that I will use, uh, Lord willing, ever, all the rest of my days. And I would assume Brother Tony would be on the same page. I will never, never be okay with losing one of y'all to this world. I will never give in to that. I'll never be okay with watching you walk away from God. I'll never be okay with watching you uh, with watching you go out in sin. It's not something that I'll ever be okay with. You understand me? It's something that I will fight against. And if it's not clear enough, don't try me. Amen. I'm not okay with losing not one of you. I'm not okay with watching one of you wreck and ruin your life. Amen. I've seen too many of them do it along the way now. Amen. I wasn't okay with them then. I'm not okay with it now. I'm not okay with watching the, uh, the depravity of sin work out in a young person's life because I've seen the path that it leads down. I've seen the destruction that comes with those things and I've seen where it will take you. And friend, I've seen the end of that thing and I'd rather not watch it happen in somebody underneath my watch. And I would say, Brother Tony and Sister Allie, I feel the same way. Uh, listen, we are not your adversary. We will take stands. We will stand on the King James Bible. We will stand on the word of God and we will, hide, uh, we will hold to the stand. 
to the standards uh, of the scriptures. And friend, if you decide that you're going to go against them, uh, we will continue to stand on this. Uh, but, but understand this, you'll go breaking our heart as you walk away from the cause of Christ. Amen. David's craving was this, that he desired to do the work of God, but that God was not going to allow him to build this house. Nathan would even say there in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that he was to go and to do all that is in thine heart for the Lord is with thee. But what you would find later on in 2 Samuel 7 is this, that God would not allow him because he was a bloody man. Second, uh, First Chronicles and, uh, 22 and verse 8, it told us that because it, it was because thou hast shed blood abundantly and hast made great wars that he, he said this, that thou shalt not build an house unto my name because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. And so we saw David's charge. David's charge uh, was to Solomon his son. And his charge was this, that he was to build an house uh, for the Lord God of Israel. Now may I say this, uh, that when you look at this charge, uh, he is not asking him to do some, uh, some regular job or to uh, take up some regular occupation, but he is telling him uh, to do the greatest work uh, that David had ever desired to do. Uh, David had desired to build this house unto God uh, that he might honor and glorify God and what he was telling his son he was telling his son to do that which I could not do and so he was going to spend the rest of his days uh, King David uh, preparing a way uh, so that his son uh, could go on for God uh, with the things and the, uh, the, the materials that he had provided uh, for, uh, for Solomon his son uh, to accomplish the work of God uh, that was set before him and may I say this uh, in this in passing I'm not spending a lot of time here. I thank God for those uh, who have paved the way for us uh, to be in the place that we are now. I thank God for the men of God that have taken stands uh, to establish uh, their lives and their lives have been pleasing uh, in the eyes of God and they have uh, established foundations uh, that were firm and true on Jesus Christ and I have, because of them, uh, come to the place in which I am. Uh, listen, I know it's not of my own ability. It's not of my own goodness. Uh, friend, I'm merely... Uh, uh, an example of what other men have done to bring us to this place use, because God has used them to do exactly that. Can I tell you, without God, David would have been nothing. He'd have still been out in the, flo in the sheep flock taking care of those sheep, but God intervened in his life. So we saw David's charge, David's craving. Let's look at the Lord's commitment in verses 9 and 10. He would say this, Behold, a son shall be born to thee, uh, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. Uh, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness in unto Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Uh, there's an interesting prophecy that is mentioned there at the conclusion of verse 10. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, but when you begin to look at this, what we understand is this, that the reign of Solomon is going to be much different than the reign of his father, King David. Uh, for you'll find this, uh, that King Solomon's reign for the most part uh, would be uh, remembered as a, a peaceful rule until sin would enter into his life because of the many wives uh, that that he would bring unto himself and the, uh, uh, the idolatry that would enter into his life. Uh, then would adversaries come into his life. And may I say this, that'll be the same way for you young people. Uh, when you begin to add sin into your life, uh, what you'll find is that trouble will come with it uh, just like it did in Solomon's days. Uh, what you see is this, uh, that for the building of the temple of the house of God, uh, for the most part, what you'll see is Solomon had a reign of peace uh, throughout his days just like like God said it would be. Can I tell you, when God says something, it's so. It don't matter whether you believe it or not. You've heard that phrase, God said it, I believe it, and it's so. It don't matter if you believe it. God says it, it's so. Period. We see the Lord's commitment. The Lord's commitment was to bring up a son that would accomplish the task that David desired to do himself. 
He said, I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. It is intriguing to me that when you look at the life of Solomon in his early days, what you'll find is this that he did his greatest work uh, for God when he thought the least of, uh, of himself. Uh, we'll find that when he asked God, when God told him, uh, ask of me and I will give it to thee, the day, uh, that Solomon said this. He said, I'll be as a child, as, a, as one that doesn't know how to go out or to come in. And so my life is one uh, that when I, that in myself, I don't think much of myself. He said, what I need is I need wisdom. I need understanding. And God was so thrilled uh, to give him exactly what he asked for, uh, that he began to add those other things uh, into his life, the material possessions uh, that Solomon had throughout his reign. Uh, but what you'll see is this, uh, that he did his greatest work uh, for the Lord uh, when he thought the least of himself. Amen. Can I tell you this? None of us are as good as we think we are. You're not all that and a bag of chips. As a matter of fact, you's headed to the same place we all was when we was lost. And it, take the, it took the same Lord to save you just like it took to save us. Oh, friend of mine, we were just sinners headed for hell. And yet God intervened in our lives to make a difference in our lives. Can I tell you, you know who made a difference in Solomon's life? The Lord made a difference in Solomon's life. You know who drug him into sin? Solomon did. You want him to see what can come out of your life under your control? It'll be the same thing that happened to every life that was under their own control. Look at the book of Judges and see what happens when every man does that which is right in his own eyes. And we see the depravity of the nation of Israel and their idolatry uh, during those days. What we need, young people, is we need individuals uh, who are wholly committed to the things of God. Uh, listen to me, friend. Uh, there is no solution in your life, uh, in this world, for the things that you need. Only God has, that, uh, has the answers that you need in this life. And what you'll find is this, uh, that you'll find that he is faithful and he is true and he is just and he will always be there uh, in your very time of need. Uh, if I could implore you to do something, I would implore you uh, to be wholly committed to the things of God. Uh, just like you find uh, Caleb uh, in the Old Testament, how you see in his heart uh, how that he was wholly committed to the things of God, uh, that he did not waver uh, when everyone else doubted, but him and Joshua uh, stood firm on the promise of God uh, that God would lead them into the promised land. And may I say this, young people, uh, something you ought to commit to heart is this, uh, that no matter what happens, no matter who falls in and out of your life, uh, no matter who walks away from you, uh, that you're going to stick with God uh, no matter what you face in this life. And friend of mine, he'll be the only one uh, that can help you through all the things uh, that you are going to go through in this life. It's going to take God to rescue you. And friend of mine, he'll be there every time you need him. The Lord's commitment. Let's look at Solomon's compulsion in verses 11 through 13. Solomon's compulsion. Let's look at verse number 11 and see the necessity. David speaking, he said this, Now my son, the Lord be with thee, and prosper thou, and build the house of the Lord thy God as he hath said of thee. You know what Solomon didn't need in his life? He didn't need great wealth. He didn't need a multitude of wives. He didn't need the horses he would go down to Egypt to get that God had commanded him not to do. He didn't need the silver that he had that could line the streets with it. You know who he needed? He needed the Lord. He needed the Lord, and David knew that much. Now, my son, the Lord be with thee. You know what it seems to imply is this, that the work before you is too great for you. So it's going to take God to get this work done. 
Can I tell you it'll be the same for your life? The work of God's too great for you. Amen. We are feeble vessels at best. We need God to do a work through us and in us in order for His work to be accomplished. The necessity is this, that He's going to need the Lord. He said this, Prosper thou and build the house of the Lord thy God as He hath said of thee. Now it is evident when you look at the life of Solomon this, that he did prosper. But can I tell you, his problem was the same problem America has. Prosperity crippled him. It brought him to a place of self-reliance. And I'll say it this way. It'd be better for us to be without money than to enter into this place to where we think we don't need God. It'd be better for us to be without the material things of this world than to get to a place like Solomon did and think we don't need God. The necessity in verse number 11, the need in verse number 12, he said this, he said, Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding and give thee charge concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. The source, the source of this need is the Lord. And the source of this wisdom is going to come from God and His understanding. And what He says is this, that He's going to give thee charge concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. Something is mentioned, I believe it's Deuteronomy chapter number 17, that the kings of the nation of Israel, and it's intriguing to me because in Deuteronomy chapter number 17, there has never been a king over the nation of Israel. And yet the Lord begins to deliver the requirements of a king to that nation. And can I say this? One of the requirements of that king was that he was to handwrite the law of the Lord. Handwrite it to keep it with him at all times. You say, what was he supposed to have? The Word of God. He was supposed to have the Word of God with him at all times. Can I tell you, somebody who ought to know the Word of God is the child of God. Amen. You've been given a book uh, in order for you to help, to help you uh, to live for God. You've been given a book, the counsel of God, and this, uh, this complete uh, text of the, of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, uh, you've been given a book uh, so that you could uh, know what thus saith the word of God. And may I say this, everybody wants to know what the will of God for their life. Uh, can I tell you, the will of God often is not something you find. The will of God is something you live in. And oftentimes the will of God you can find as written in what thus saith the word of God, the scriptures. Uh, and what you'll find is this, uh, that the need for your life can often be found in the scriptures. And the reason many uh, can't seem to find the will of God is because they don't open this book and they don't see uh, what God has to say with them. And what it does is it cripples your relationship with God when you don't read His Word. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Young men, those of you that say that you have been called to preach, you only go as far with God as you go with His Word. This book, His Word has been esteemed higher than his name. Now that name's pretty high. But God has said that he esteems this book higher than his own name. I just think we ought to read it. Amen. I just think we ought to study it. I think he's got something to say to you. He said, only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding. Give thee charge. Solomon's statement as you get to his rule is this, that I, he didn't know how to go out and to come in. The fact of the matter is this, he didn't know how to lead the children of Israel. What he needed is he needed God to intervene in his life and to help him with his great need. Can I tell you, young people, you need the same thing. Can I tell you, not so young people, 
you need the same thing. So we saw the necessity in verse 11, the need in verse number 12. Let's look at the notice for obedience in verse number 13. He said this, Then shalt thou prosper. If thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel, be strong and of good courage, dread not, nor be dismayed. So what you'll see is this. What he requires of Solomon is that he be obedient to the direction of God. He said, if you'll do so, then what you'll find is you'll find the blessings of God in your lives. And listen, in a day in which everybody wants to use uh, that name it and claim it or whatever nonsense they call it of our day, uh, that term prosper uh, does not mean that God owes you the world. What you'll find is this, uh, that God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory uh, that you'll find in Christ Jesus. Uh, What you see is this, uh, that prosperity is not the way that uh, that the world thinks it is Uh, what you'll see that prosperity uh, in this Christian life is this uh, that God supplies all your needs according to his riches Uh, now last time I checked uh, he has great wealth uh, for he owns uh, for he owns the earth according to uh, Psalms chapter number 24 for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and so uh, God has great wealth and so there what you see is this uh, that there is a necessity of Solomon in his life uh, that he is to be obedient. He said this, uh, that that if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments uh, which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. He said what you need to do is you need to listen uh, to what thus saith the word of God. Uh, You need to open your ear and receive in uh, what God has to say uh, in his word. And can I say this young people as you make your way to youth camp this week uh, you're going to hear the preached word of God. I know each and every man that's going to stand in that pulpit and I've seen them carry a King James Bible all the days that I've known them and what they're going to do is they're going to take the word of God and they're going to begin to preach to you and you need to predetermine that what you're going to do is you're going to receive the word of God that you're going to listen and then it's not just going to go in one ear and out the other but you're going to let the word of God do a work in your heart to change you in your life. Can I tell you the word of God I can make a distinct difference in an individual's life friend of mine uh, the day after you get saved I would implore you to dive into the scriptures and watch God do a work in your heart you say where at pick a place there are great spiritual truths throughout this book in its entirety the need for Solomon was obedience what he said was this take heed do what you're supposed to do. What I'm afraid of is this, that many go to youth camp just to have fun. And that you miss out on the greatest blessing that's available to you in that place. That God wants to do a work in your heart. So we saw Solomon's compulsion. Let's look at number three, David's problem in verses 14 through 16. David's problem. Let's look at David's determination in verse number 14. Now behold, in my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord. And hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand thousand talents of silver and of brass and iron without weight. For it is in abundance, timber also and stone have I prepared, and thou mayest add thereto. It's an intriguing statement made by David there in verse number 14. He said this, now behold. And so his requirement to Solomon is this. I want you to think about the things that I'm about to say to you. Consider what is being presented to you in the next statements of David from David, his father. He said this, Now behold, in my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord. What you'll see is this in uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 7. David 
is told by the prophet Nathan that he is not going to be the one that builds the house of God. And as I stated this morning, what you'll find in many individuals' lives is uh, that when David got the okay that he was not going to uh, build the house of God, many individuals uh, would have then went to the house and they'd have kicked back their lazy boy and uh, lifted up the seats and they'd have let back uh, and just relaxed uh, concerning the things of God because God had told him uh, that he was not going to be able to build the house of God because he was a bloody man. Uh, but what you'll find in David's life is this, uh, that he just committed himself uh, the more to the cause uh, for his own son. He said this, he said, In my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord. And what you'll see is this, uh, that David went through the trouble uh, in his life uh, that he could prepare everything that Solomon would need uh, to go on for God and do the work of God. Uh, he went through and he accumulated all the gold they would need. He accumulated all the silver and the brass and the iron uh, and the timber and the stones. Uh, he said this, if that's not enough, uh, you can add to it. But what you'll find is this, uh, David David went through the trouble of preparing everything that they would, uh, that Solomon would need uh, to build the house of God. And may I say this, young people, uh, what you'll find in your youth leaders is this, uh, that in their trouble, uh, they have tried to pave a way uh, that would help you to live for God. Uh, they've tried to teach you the scriptures. They've tried to prepare you uh, the paths of God uh, through the word of God to show you uh, what thus saith the Lord. And they have gone through the trouble of doing that in your life. And if I could say it this way, uh, God's done gone through a lot of trouble uh, to help us uh, in our days. Uh, he has gone out of his way uh, to help mankind. Uh, what do you think Calvary was? It was the greatest trouble uh, to step outside of uh, to help mankind. And yet God was willing uh, to pay that great price uh, for the sins of mankind uh, so that you might be rescued. And David was willing to pay whatever it took for his son to be able to do the work of God in his life. Let me ask you parents, how willing are you to pay a price that great so that your kids might live for God? There's stuff falling out of the pulpit. Shook it too much, amen. What you see in verse 14 is this, that it's David's determination. He is determined to prepare the path for his son to go on for God. Can I tell you, I don't know what I'd have to do to prepare the path for my children to live for God other than to have them in the house of God every time the doors are open to teach them to read the scriptures and to pray to God because that's what God requires. To show them that there is a better life to live that is to live for God. Can I tell you, if that's what trouble is, I'll take it every day. If that's the requirement of my life, I'll gladly lay down this life. And if they get grandeur out of this life for, uh, for living for God, then so be it. I'd rather see them live for God than anything else. I wonder if your heart's the same way, parents. In a day in which most adults only care about themselves, well, I'd love to see our young people live for God. I'd love to see them sell out for the cause of Christ. And I'd love to watch God do a great work in their lives to see their homes changed, to eventually see their families live for Him. And if all it requires is some sleepless nights and some heavy praying and showing them the way, then I will gladly spend and be spent. David said, in my trouble, I've prepared for the house of the Lord. David's determination in verse 15, we see diligent workers. He said this, moreover, there are workmen with thee in abundance, hewers and workers of stone and timber and all manner of cunning men for every manner of work. What you'll find is this, Solomon wasn't going to be the only individual building this house of God. 
for there were men that were already prepared to do the work. Oftentimes in this life, you get to the place where you think you're the only one living for God. Elijah felt the same way. The prophet, the man of God. He walks out of 1 Kings chapter number 18. I believe it's 18. With the prophets of Baal and he's called fire down from heaven to lick up the sacrifice and the water that was given on the altar. And Jezebel tells him that his life shall be as the life of those prophets of Baal that are slaughtered after that, after God sends fire down from, from heaven. And he begins to head for the mountains and there is a, a season of what I'll call discouragement in the life of Elijah in which he makes this statement, I alone. He thought he was the only one living for God and God was quick to remind him that I have a remnant that is still serving God. Can I tell you, this isn't the only church in these United States of America that's serving God. We're not the only ones that hold to the old paths. We're not the only ones that still hold up this King James Bible. We're not the only ones that are doing the work of God. There's still a bunch of us. I know it may not be as many as there once was, but there's still a bunch that are doing the work of God. And what you'll find in Solomon's life is this. David has already prepared him, those other individuals, to help him to get the work done. And can I tell you this, young people? Get to where you can lean on those that are faithful because they will help you in serving God. Amen. 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 Brother Farrell, don't cling to those that don't love God. Amen. Brother Caleb, don't cling to those that don't love God. Right. They will not take you towards God. They will walk you away from Him. Amen. Diligent workers, let's look at the demand of verse number 16, and then we'll dive into the last point. He said this, the demand. He said, of the gold, the silver, and the brass, and the iron, there is no number. He said this, arise therefore and be doing, and the Lord be with thee. Oftentimes in this life, the phrase is said, talk is cheap. I can't tell you how many people I've seen that tell me how hard they work. Everybody is the hardest worker where they work at. Just ask them. They'll tell you. Amen? But talk is cheap. You know what he said to Solomon? He said, get up. Arise. Because of everything that has been prepared for you, there ought to be action to the work that is set before you. Don't just sit back. Do the work that is set before you. And if I could implore you, young people, what I would say is this, that you need to be busy about the things of God. That you need to get up and not just sit back and watch somebody else do it. What you need to do is you need to be active around the things of God. That you need to be active in the Word of God. That you need to have a consistent a prayer life uh, in your life, uh, meaning this, that you have a, a, a good relationship with your heavenly Father. He doesn't need to be that stranger in your life uh, that you just meet with on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights. No, uh, you need to have a relationship with Him in which you talk and you commune with the Lord and, ha- and watch Him work in your life. Uh, what, he told, what David told Solomon was this. He said, Arise therefore and be doing, and the Lord be with thee. He said, You need to be active Active about these things that I have given you to do. Let's look at David's pronouncement and we'll be done. In verses 17 through 19, he said this, the required unity in verse 17. He said, David also commanded all the princes of Israel to help Solomon, his son, saying, what you'll see is this, that there is a need for unity amongst the brethren. When you look in the book of Acts and you look at that early church age, you'll see that one of the greatest attributes of that early church was this, that they were of one mind and one accord. Amen. 
that no individual was greater than the whole. Y'all ever run into anybody and their opinion's the only one that matters? They don't care what you have to say. Yeah. Can I tell you that's somebody that's full of themselves? We use another five-letter word called pride for that. Yes, yes. Also something that God can't stand. What you see of these individuals is this, that they were committed to do the work of God. And they were committed to help Solomon to do this work. You know where they'd have run into problems? They'd have run into problems if one of them was seeking the glory for what was about to be done. I don't even believe you'll find Solomon seeking the glory for the work that's about to be done. As a matter of fact, what I believe you'll see is this, that as he kneels on his knees with his hands raised before God and begins to pray to God, you'll see that he asked God for some very specific things for the nation of Israel. And you'll see that God answered those very specific things. But if you'll get a group of people that just desire to be pleasing to God, then you'll see God do a great work just like you watched Solomon do in his early days at that. We see required unity. Let's look at the recognition of the righteous one in verse number 18. He said this, Is not the Lord your God with you? Hath he not given you rest on every side? For he hath given the inhabitants of the land into mine hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. Let me give you an intriguing statement that is made here. What you'll find is you'll not find one adversary that is greater than his God. You say, who's God? Solomon's God. Is not the Lord your God with you? Hath he not given you rest on every side? For he hath given the inhabitants of the land into mine hand. You say, who's mine hand? It's David. God has given me every adversary that would have stood against you to do this work. And he has given you peace and rest on every side. Can I tell you what he's done? He's provided Solomon a way to accomplish the work of God in his life. Listen to me, young people. Where God guides, God will provide for you. If God directs your path, then he will make sure you have what you need to do his work. You say, how do you know? Because we're given example after example in the word of God. Recognition of the righteous ones. Look at the reactive response in verse number 19. Reactive response. And we'll be finished. He said, now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Arise therefore and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. It's an intriguing statement as he makes this to Solomon. Set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Let me ask you this, young people. How interested are you in seeking God as you go into this week of teen camp? How interested are you in getting as close to God as you can in this coming week? James gives us an interesting principle. He says this, draw nigh to God. And he will what? He will draw nigh to you. It's an intriguing concept that the closer you get to God, the closer God gets to you. Solomon has a great need to get this work done. 
but his greatest need is to seek the Lord so that he might be pleasing in his eyes. How about it, young people? What is the desire of your heart? What we learn of the heart is an interesting thing in our King James Bible, that the heart is desperately wicked, that it is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And I've said it before, I'll say it again. And it's interesting when you look at men like David who was after, a man after God's own heart. And you look at Daniel, in the book of Daniel, that he had a different heart. And you look at these other individuals who lived lives that were pleasing in the eyes of God and that God commended their heart for their desire for Him. And so it brings me to this conclusion that a heart that is set on seeking God is a heart that is pleasing in the eyes of God. You want to do something for God? Then you're going to have to live for God. You want to see God work? Then you're going to have to live for Him. Or you can live like everybody else out in the world and not see God do a great work in your life. Let's have everybody stand this evening. Connor, you grab a song for us.